Hello, everybody. My name is Claire Boothroyd, and I'm the current president of Aspire. Welcome to today's Ed Talk, which is on chronic endometritis. And I am very honoured today to introduce to you Carlos Simone. And he is a professor of OBGYN at the University of Valencia and also the University of Harvard, and is the president of the Carlos Simone Foundation. So welcome, Carlos. Um, thank you very much for giving us some of your time. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. My pleasure. So we might kick off with the questions. Carlos, what do we know about chronic endometritis and its contribution to infertility? Well, you know, chronic endometritis, um, as uh, our colleagues know, is we defined as a, a chronic inflammation in the endometrium that uh, it's produced in the, in the origin of this inflammation, it should be an infection. But uh, later on, maybe the infection will not go on, but uh, the inflammation will persist. And we have been chasing this for a long time because we know that it's there. And uh, several, three basic techniques has been used to diagnose this. But uh, we, I think we are all aware that when we have an endometritis, uh, acute endometritis is much easier to recognize because this is clinically more profound. But chronic endometritis goes many times undiagnosed, but we know that exists. And uh, I think that the main issue here is to be able to have a proper diagnosis and then a personalized treatment. The contribution in infertility uh, has been ranged. There are many literature about that. We know that uh, this is important. In about 40% of patients that have been recognized to suffer chronic endometritis in those with repeated implantation failure. The numbers change throughout the world, throughout the, we know how heterogeneous the, uh, any issue in our field could be. But I think that uh, um, we all agree that the contribution of this part in repeated implantation failure is an important one and uh, should be carefully considered. Okay, so that's very important. So. 40% of um, patients with recurrent implantation failure will have chronic endometritis. Carlos, are the diagnostic criteria for chronic endometritis agreed upon or what are they? Yeah, this is the main issue. I mean, we have three main <clears throat> diagnostic techniques to do so. <clears throat> One is the hysteroscopy. And also you, you will see that depending of uh, our heart, the heart of the clinicians, you go more for one or the other technique, which create a lot of bias in the diagnosis. Again, the techniques are hysteroscopy, that we know how to do it. We just introduce the scope and we see the images that uh, at the end, we think that this means a chronic endometritis, name it. So this is hysteroscopy. Uh, the other technique is just endometrial biopsy and immunohistochemical a characterization of these CD138 uh, positive cells, plasmocytes, uh, which is the immunohistochemical criteria. Uh, and the other is the, uh, just the basic uh, microbiological culture. Each of them, any of them, have positive and negative issues. As said, hysteroscopy overdiagnosed. Endome chronic endometritis, because any red spot could be considered, any strawberry uh, image could be linked like that. And of course, there are hysteroscopy experts that they will claim and have been published that is quite reliable. However, this is the bias. Immunohistochemical uh, uh, detection of these cells, this is nowadays the gold standard, but this is quite uh, uh, difficult to understand. We continue having this as a gold standard because those are just plasmocytes. First, plasmocytes are specific for myeloma, but for they're in a specific for any other infection and of course for chronic infections. Also, the way to recognize those plasmocytes depend on the laboratory. Some of them they use 10 HPF uh, I mean fields, other they use five. And also, those that uh, we work in the endometrium, we know that the endo epithelial endometrium express CD138 uh, 
a, a marker. So this makes, again, that this is not a reliable uh, diagnostic test, even if it is used nowadays as a gold standard. And finally, come the microbiological culture. <clears throat> we know that this is all about enrichment of specific conditions to grow the most likely candidates to have an infection there. But uh, if something has happened in the last 10 years, is that uh, next generation sequencing has uh, uh, teach us that 60%, between 40 and 60% of the bacteria, they are not culturable and they can be diagnosed by uh, any specific technique indicating the 16S ribosomal RNA of the, of the bacteria or even by the DNA from that. So the thing is, all of these three techniques, they have those pros and cons. And uh, we published in American Journal <clears throat> four years ago uh, with Tori Ciccinelli, <clears throat> a work in which we compare these three techniques in about 100 patients that they have been analyzed with the three techniques in the very same samples. And uh, interestingly enough, only in 20% of them, they, were a con they, they coincide. So the agreement between these three in a specific techniques is only 20%. And I think this is the main problem to diagnose chronic endometritis nowadays. In this paper, we create a debate in fertile sterile also in 2022 that you can reach that with the different expert, experts discussing the pros and cons for the diagnosis of chronic endometritis. Uh, in this, we just raise the, the point that uh, uh, molecular microbiology should take care now of the control of the diagnosis of chronic endometritis, as is in any field of medicine. By analyzing, even just with PCR, the most important candidates for the pathogens, or with uh, just untarget <clears throat> NGS, uh, what we did in this work that you can, you can find in American Journal, is that 90% of those 20% that they coincide in the three techniques, 90% were diagnosed by molecular microbiology, as again in any other field. In this paper, we, we just ended by saying, look, can you imagine that uh, chronic hepatitis, we were discussing whether chronic hepatitis should be diagnosed by endoscopy or <clears throat> just by CD1 or immunohistochemistry. Uh, I think that uh, we all prefer that chronic hepatitis will be diagnosed by the presence of the virus or of the bacteria that may produce this disease. So the, the, just in a nutshell, the point here is that to have a reliable diagnostic technology <clears throat> that could be lead us to the presence of this infection that uh, nowadays we can do it through 16S ribosomal RNA and even the DNA does not give us the absolute presence of the pathogens, RNA, it can give us this presence. So uh, my suggestion, our suggestion was to evolve the, the diagnostic techniques to the next step, just by analyzing with using molecular micro microbiology that techniques that are available now in the market uh, to see at what extent the presence of pathogens can be uh, identify in the candidates of chronic endometritis. And Carlos, when you say molecular microbiology, do you mean 16S ribosomal RNA, or is that different? <clears throat> no, th th this is what I mean. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> this is actually what I mean, is to use uh, uh, molecular techniques to identify the microbes that they will be able to produce. And you can have from 16S ribosomal RNA to uh, unsupervised diagnostic or even with PCR for the six more specific pathogens that they are causing chronic endometritis. But at the end is to find something objective that you can just identify rather than to go for the, the other different possibilities that I just already mentioned pros and cons. Mm. So can I just unpack the hysteroscopy first? So we've got three three sort of contributors to the diagnosis. We've got the hysteroscopic appearance, we've got the histological and looking for the CD138 staining in the endometrium, and we've got a variety of microbiological options. With the hysteroscopy, you mentioned hemorrhages. 
Are there any pathognomonic findings on hysteroscopy that you say that's definitely endometritis? So sorry, sorry, can you repeat again? I, I yeah. Are there any are there any specific can we just unpack the changes of hysteroscopy? Are there any changes that you say, yes, that's very likely to be endometr chronic endometritis on that hysteroscopic appearance? There is, a, a, I mean, the, the expert hysteroscopist can just teach you about the different type of images that uh, they identify by saying, yes, this is a chronic endometritis. But what I mean is that uh, if we take Ettore Ciccinelli, which is a, uh, hysteroscopy is defending uh, this type of diagnosis. And when we just pull together in the same patient the results given by hysteroscopy, by uh, immunohistochemistry, and by uh, just uh, cellular culture, only 20% they agree. So, uh, and, and the sum up of the three techniques was that hysteroscopy was overestimating. And also keep in mind that expert hysteroscopists, I mean, we know how to do an hysteroscopy. But uh, to have uh, everyday views of the findings, it takes a lot of uh, time and expertise. So we are not all experts in hysteroscopy. So that's why I think this will go overrepresented in terms of the diagnosis of chronic endometritis. Excellent. So if we're really suspicious of it in recurrent implantation failure, we might do all three, um, three of the methods. Is that right? Is that what you're implying? What I mean is that if uh, if you do the three of them, only in 20% you will have an agreement. So we rather, and you know what is the cost of to do the three, to do the three of, of them. With this paper that I mentioned to you that we compare all of these three, the message is go to molecular microbiology first. Go mm -hmm. to do just a, a endometrial fluid collection and a test to show you whether 16S ribosomal RNA indicates the presence of the specific pathogens causing chronic endometritis. If uh, uh, once you have this demonstration, this will be completely clear. If you do not have this, then we can discuss and we can do, but uh, uh, rather I will go to the, to the direct identification of something that we can once identify, treat it and follow and see what happens. I'm with you. So is that collected, say, with like a sort of a papel sample, a small endometrial sample collected while the lady is awake? Um, is that where you're, how you're collecting that sample of the endometrium for the microbiological tests? Yes. You know, there are different tests in the market. I do not have, I'm not uh, uh, taking care of, of these things now, but depending on the test, you can do this in only endometrial fluid, which is not basically non-invasive, it's just as, as if you do an embryo transfer, but instead of you introduce the, the transfer catheter empty and you just suck uh, uh, just endometrial fluid, one drop will be enough for some tests. For other tests, you may need an endometrial biopsy uh, that they, they will, so depending on, on what, uh, what is there, you will have to use one or the other type of samples. But what I'm taking here, what I'm trying to do, to, to, to discuss with my colleagues is the concept itself, to go to the roots, to the cause of this chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so if we do the test and it's just an endometrial fluid and it's negative, where do you, and you're suspicious of endometritis, where do you go from there? Um, what would you suggest is the correct pathway? Well, <clears throat> depend on uh, how did you, how are you testing? How are you, um, what is your suspicious of this chronic endometritis come from? Typically is uh, you have a patient with repeated implantation failure. This is how you, you, you go to this diagnosis. So if you have this clinical diagnosis and uh, in a proper molecular microbiology properly published and show efficacy, sensibility, and specificity is negative, I will go in a different direction. I don't think that by doing an hysteroscopy or by doing an immunohistochemistry is going to improve these results. On the contrary, mm -hmm. if you have a positive one, then you can go for a specific uh, antibiotic treatment. It should be a specific. This is very important. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I just advanced uh, another question could be, is there any proof of that? 
Well, there is a paper published quite recently by a Japanese group in which mm, what they did is just take 200 patients with repeated implantation failure. They offer them a microbiological test uh, to do so. Um, and approximately half of them, they say uh, no. So they were undiagnosed and half of them, they say yes, and they were diagnosed. In part of them, they identify those pathogens. In part of them, they do not identify pathogens. Say there is no any infection, uh, past infection here or present infection. So they treat specifically the, the patients that they were uh, diagnosed as affected and they show an improvement in implantation rate, pregnancy rates, uh, reducing miscarriage and improving life birth rates. This paper, I can, I can look for the reference, is an independent Japanese group. And, uh, and I think this is the first interventional study that they were published in JARC, in the, the, in JARC uh, about uh, how to really move from untarget therapies is, I mean, just uh, conventional antibiotics <clears throat> to a rather a specific diagnostic and a specific treatment. So, Carlos, would I be right in thinking that if your microbiological test was negative, you would not recommend treating with antibiotics? Not at all. No, if this is negative, it's negative. So, uh, and if it is positive, should be treated. So, mm. but, but if it's negative, you don't give just broad spectrum antibiotics on clinical suspicion? Well, because, you know, broad, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics may, may cause, may affect the microbiome and they will produce just the opposite effect, which is what we are just watching more and more. Uh, don't give a conventional, don't give a wide range uh, antibiotic therapies because this also affects our microbiome, the endometrial microbiome exists, the balance should be there. And by treating our patients uh, just random, uh, we are just making more, uh, we, we are not helping, we are producing more harm that uh, really good for the patients. Yes. Okay, so just recapping on this, and you may want to um, interrupt me, please do if I haven't quite got it right, but Expert, some there are some expert hysteroscopists who would be able to diagnose endometritis on its hysteroscopic appearance and that there are some particular features. And there are also some histopathological features, but the um, using the CD138. But the, the key really is getting the microbiome and looking at to see what bugs are growing in the uterus or have been growing in the uterus and having that detailed microbiological testing. And that's the real key. And that enables us to direct antibiotic therapy rather than blind or blunderbuss antibiotic therapy. Would that be correct, um, Carlos? Have I summarized your, um, your opinion there? Absolutely. I can give you, I have found out the, the paper that I mentioned to you. Uh, the, the title is Therapeutic Intervention Based on Gene Sequence Analysis of Microbial 16S Ribosomal RNA of the Intrauterine Microbiome Improves Pregnancy Outcome in IVF Patients, a prospective cohort study. The first author is Iwami, and this paper comes from Japan, was published in 2023 in the Journal of Assisted Reproduct Reproduction and Genetics. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So are these microbiological tests available widely in clinical practice or do you have to have a special laboratory set up for this? No, we, I mean, there are, there are several of them. Uh, there are some of them based on 16S ribosomal RNA, as mentioned. And I, I am aware that there, are, there should be at least four or five of these tests. So I, 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 I suggest to, to our colleagues to look for them, to look for the literature that is backing these proofs and just choose one. So there is 16S ribosomal RNA and there is also PCR. PCR is more focused on these five specific pathogens that they are the, the, the most important cause. Uh, and, and, uh, and then there are also several tests of that. The only bias of those tests is that they only recognize the existence of the DNA, uh, ribosomal RNA, uh, but this is bacterial DNA. 
It could be that the bacteria is not there, but the DNA remains. But there are another tests that they are coming now, just detecting RNA. With, if you just detect the RNA, it means that the, the pathogen is, is, is alive and is there. It's not just a, a, a rest of what happens before. So those tests exist and, and, and they are out there nowadays. Fantastic. Carlos, one last question. Is there evidence that treating endometritis makes the difference to fertility? This is exactly what I mentioned about this paper that I just gave it to you, the reference. This is okay. the first yeah. interventional study. And, uh, and I think this for the first time, uh, what they, they show is that uh, they found, when they found this presence of those pathogens, and they treated specifically with antibiotics that is sensitive for these uh, pathogens, they find out that in the, in the first month, basically 75% uh, of those patients, they cure uh, if they treat it specifically. And the, the, the one that they were not cured, they try again uh, another until they cure. And by going back and treating them and then transfer embryos, they find out that in those patients that they were treated uh, versus the control, in the control, they found that the, uh, I'm reading the paper now, the life birth rate in the controls that they have were undiagnosed, they were 9.4%, whereas in the life birth in the treated patients, specifically after molecular macro microbiology diagnostic was 33.6% of life birth rate at the first embryo uh, transfer. They have also uh, they, they have also the statistics in accumulative embryo transfer in two of them. And again, they show that the life birth rate goes from 31 uh, by in the control group to 48.9 in the treated group. So I think this is the first proof, again, should be repeated, again, to all what we always say. But I think this is this proof for the first time in 200 patients. Uh, randomization is, is not perfect, of course. It was depending just that the patient accept or not to have the test done. But uh, 64 were undiagnosed and 131, they were subject to, to the, this specific cystine S ribosomal RNA and treatment. So I think that this is the, the first one, should be repeated. But my suggestion here for my colleagues is just to go more specific, to go target to the specific diagnostic. If this is produced by a microbe, then we should go to my molecular microbiology to answer this and treat it specifically. No wide spectrum antibiotics, please. Nobody does this in any field because it creates more problems than benefits. Great words of wisdom. Thank you very much, Carlos, for a lovely discussion and appraisal of what's a relatively new um, um, identified disease for our, us who manage patients with infertility. So chronic endometritis. And I thank you very much, Carlos, for a very interesting Ed Talk. And um, we'll look forward to hearing from it all as it evolves and the research evolves. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you so much. My pleasure.